Uh, I do want to uh, make a, a, a special public thank you or express a special public uh, debt of gratitude to Landa Lakes for helping make this lunch possible, the butter at your tables. I said, to, I said to Chris today, I said, how about this for a little bumper set, utter to butter. I said, has anybody ever said that? He said, no, I don't think they have. I said, okay, I get royalties on this one. Um, I am looking forward to this conversation very much. We are here today, literally, because of a conversation I had with Chris Polosinski, Chris, three years ago. We were on a panel together. I think it was for the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, and we were talking about the planet. And we were talking about where we're going. Nine billion people, climate change, nearly a billion food insecure. And we were talking about the need to have more of this kind of dialogue and to have more people who are unfamiliar with things learn about things, which is what journalism is all about. Good journalism, and Dennis Dimmick will talk about this because they've done it brilliantly in National Geographic, takes you on a journey. Good storytelling takes you on a journey. It takes you on a journey to a place you haven't been or a place that you're not familiar with, intellectually, emotionally, geographically. And Chris said, we need to bring people together. And we started talking about this, and it's very dangerous to put two guys like us together <laughs> without adult supervision. And, and they said, let's, let's try to do something that convenes people from a lot of different walks of life around the notion of telling the story. And his observation, he's going to talk to you more about this in a moment, is that such a small sliver of our population now is directly involved in the food that we eat. We all eat, but as we saw before, how many of us grow? Not many. Chris is the CEO of a very big dairy cooperative, Land of Lakes, which works with, works with dairy farmers and more all around the world. He's going to talk to you for about 10 minutes. He's going to explain the global food challenge that Land Lakes is leading, which involves many of the schools here, including GW. And then you'll have a few minutes when he's done to kind of ponder some of these things and some of the things you might want to do before we go back across the street. We're going to start promptly at 1.30. So without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Polisinski. Well, first I have to thank Frank for that very kind introduction. We did start this uh, over a cup of coffee, I think, at a bagel shop. Uh, but that was the easy part. The hard part was making all of this happen. So my compliments, Frank, uh, for doing that, because I think it is a powerful, powerful idea. I also want to thank all of you for being here, because this is part of the solution. Um, I've got about 10 minutes of comments, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you, which is we have to get out of our silos. There's a great amount of energy around food and food production. And we have to get out of our silos and talk to one another about that. Because that's how we'll get more robust ideas. That's how we'll build our collective knowledge base. And frankly, that's how we'll learn to be more tolerant of one another's ideas. Because this challenge of feeding the soon to be 9 billion people on the planet, it's a whole lot bigger than any one of our ideas. It's going to take all of our ideas. And we have to be a lot more inclusive of different solutions to feed a hungry planet in an increasingly sustainable way. So Frank, thank you for kind of taking that idea and making it happen. But thank you for all of you for getting outside of your comfort zone. Because you know what? When we're outside of our normal peer group, it's kind of sloppy. Um, not everybody agrees with you. And you have to think. I talked to Tara from your office just a minute ago on the way in. And we were talking about the internet, which has so many really positive things, right? But one of the negative things is when we go get information, we, we seek information that kind of confirms what we already think. That's not necessarily getting more knowledgeable. Where we get more knowledgeable is by mixing it up. So thank you for being willing to do that, and uh, it's really an exciting thing to see happen and to be part of. I do have about 10 minutes of comments, and I just want to give you our perspective at Land Lakes and my own personal views around what it's going to take to feed 9 billion people. Um, and let me underline that I think part of those views uh, are going to be shaped by the fact that I just got back from Africa. And I can come back around on this later if we have time, but one of the things we have to recognize is we're a rich country. We enjoy the safest, lowest cost, most abundant food supply on the planet and in history of man, right here, right now. And that gives us wonderful choices to segment and to market and to do things differently. We have to be careful. By the way, enjoy those choices. I'm a free markets guy. Enjoy those choices. 
but we have to be careful that we don't make the choices we are making an imposition on those in food sin insecure parts of the world. And I'd love to come back to that. But let me talk about our view, and let me start with just a minute around who we are at Land Lakes. Everybody thinks of us as the butter company. That's accurate. Frank, thank you for the butter plug. I'm not sure about the tagline. Uh, you're a good journalist, but... No. Um, and, and that's accurate. We are the butter company. The, the story for us is we were formed in the early 20s by a bunch of farmers, dairy farmers in the upper Midwest, who uh, shipped their milk to local creameries and produced a very high-quality product, butter from sweet cream. Uh, they were small farmers. They had no bargaining power in the channel. They couldn't get their product to market profitably. So simple idea. They said, what if we formed a marketing company to aggregate our supply, gain power in the channel, and market our product? Simple idea, powerful, it worked. Product took off like a rocket because it really was a better product than the product that was available in the population centers on the East Coast, primarily butter from sour cream. I'm not sure what that is, but it does not sound very good. They then said really shortly in the mid-20s, you know, that worked, aggregating our supply. What if you aggregated our demand and bought things for us cheaper than we could on our own? So they formed a feed company at the time and a crop inputs company to give them the things they needed to grow their own crops. If you turn the clock forward, just like Frank said, that's been a successful but powerful model. We are now a $15 billion Fortune 200 company. We are still farmer owned and those are still, still our three primary business segments. Land Lakes Foods, Purina Animal Feed, and Winfield Solutions Crop Inputs, which is really a high-end big data company that shows farmers how to grow things in their soil, in their climate, for the way they want to farm. In addition, this business is informed by being farmer-owned, which is unusual, and by the fact for nearly four decades we've been involved in development projects in food insecure parts of the world. 75 plus countries, almost 300 projects, uh, small, medium, and large, that build food infrastructure in parts of the world that need food infrastructure. That's a unique, if not, it's a very unusual, if not unique, point of view. It's end-to-end, -end, it's farmer-owned, and it's global. I have to be careful to say, I don't think we're any smarter than any of you. In fact, I'm feeling a lot less smart listening to some of the great ideas you all had this morning or any of the great companies who are in the food industry. But the companies in the food industry tend to cluster. At the front end of the food supply chain, highly branded goods, or at the back end, commodity production, logistics, and so on. Our view is shaped by an end-to-end -end view and farmer ownership and a global presence for nearly four decades, helping folks who are food insecure. What do we see? First thing, pretty obvious. You've heard it this morning a couple of times, population trends, income trends. We are going to need to nearly double food production by 2050. 70% increase in food production. Twice as much dairy, twice as much meat, nearly 50% more cereal. What else do we see? We're going to have to do this with very limited resources. 12% more arable land, and in reality, only half of that can be brought into production. And there's already a water crisis. We don't feel it here in America. California is right now. But demand for water is going to outstrip supply dramatically in just a couple of decades. So we got a nearly double food production with very, very limited resources. Well, can it be done? I have to tell you, I am an optimist. Uh, this is a chart that just maps inputs and outputs, the horizontal line is the value of all inputs, land, labor, capital, feed, seed, and so on. The slow, upward sloping line is the value of all output going all the way back to the 40s. And you can see we are already, we are growing today two and a half more times more stuff than we did in the 40s. So we've already done it. Great productivity story. That's what we need to continue. By the way, the fun facts, and I'll come back to them. In the 30s, one farmer fed 10. Today, it's well over one farmer feeding 155. In the 30s, we spent nearly a quarter of our income on food as a society. Today, it's 10%, and that includes, it's less than 10%, and that includes food away from home. And in the 30s, 22% of the workforce was engaged in agriculture, and I will come back to that. Today, we've been so productive that well less than 2%. I think the number is something like 1.4% of America farms. By the way, that last point gives rise to a 
kind of interesting situation. If we had questions about food production in our parents' or grandparents' day, we talked about it at the dinner table. We asked a trusted aunt or uncle or neighbor. Now, we go to the internet. Really important that we're having meetings like this to build our knowledge base. By the way, farmers talk about that great productivity story among themselves in terms of output, yields, and so on. They don't talk about it like this, which is a sustainability story. This just plots corn production and planted acres back to the 30s. And if you did the math, we're growing six and a half times more corn on 13% fewer acres. Now, when I'm talking to farmers, they'll remind me of what that meal means in terms of yield per acre. We heard it this morning, from 70 to 170. Think about it from a sustainability standpoint. Six and a half time more, times more stuff on 13% less land, less water, less crop inputs, less fertilizer. That's a sustainability story. That's an authentic sustainability story. Wow. Now go back to the challenge we're facing. Doubling food output with very limited resources. Can it be done? Absolutely. But here's the challenge. It's the 98%, 2%. This great productivity story has largely been enabled by two things. And this is a simplification because I only have 10 minutes and I probably only have three minutes left. Uh, farmers adopted modern business practices on the farm. They got bigger and were able to employ capital, not just labor, to drive productivity. And by the way, big is kind of equated with bad. Not so much. Think about, there are no big farmers that are hatched. Big farmers got big because they were once small farmers. They were just good at it. The second thing is farmers have been brilliant at adopting safe, proven technology. Brilliant. Farming's hard work. You're subject to nature. Does rain come? Pests? Disease? So everything from mechanization in harvesting to today's spectacular seed products are part of this great productivity story. But here's what's happening, 98%, 2%, and it's the point I started with. There's a lot of energy around food and food production. And there's a lot of discussion about food and food production. But I don't know if it's as informed as it needs to be, because we all talk among ourselves. If we go out of our international development group and talk to the NGO community, they talk almost exclusively about food security and the need to feed hungry people. If we go to farmers, they can do a much better job than I just did about that great productivity story. Six and a half times more corn on 13% fewer acres, wow. But they'll talk about it in yield, bushels per acre. If we go to academia, they have probably the most robust view and then the most grounded in the science and the fact, but they talk among themselves. They don't go engage with consumers who have a lot of questions and they're not asking their aunt or that trusted relative. They're going to the internet. And there's all this great energy, but here's the punchline, and it's a simple one. Meetings like this, Frank, thank you, are the secret. Because it builds our knowledge base, it gives us more robust ideas, and it increases our tolerance for different points of view. Because right now in our silos, when we do get together, the discussions are very polarizing. And it's frustrating to me. The discussions go like this, big is bad, technology and everything else but my food. So let's have this discussion about no technology in food. Let's have this discussion about only small farms are good or only large farms are good. Or what production technique is better than the next. That's maddening because the challenge and the stakes are high. There's a moral obligation to feed the soon to, nine bil the soon to be nine billion people on the planet. There's an economic obligation, and there's an obligation from a political security standpoint. This is a big topic, and we have to engage like adults in this topic, so this is the kind of meeting, because we only need to ch change one simple thing, one or the other, to and. There's plenty of room for large and small farms. Do we need large farms? Absolutely, positively, yes to produce the quantity of food, safe, affordable, 
food, that we need to feed hungry. Do we need small farms? Absolutely, for a lot of different reasons. They need, small farms are the incubators of great new ideas. We heard some of them this morning. By the way, small farms keep rural communities vibrant. Without vibrant rural communities, we won't have successful large farms. Because large farms need a vet, they need a welder, they need a place to send their kids to school. So we've got to have large and small. We've got to have a blend of the technology we know today with technology that we haven't even thought of or that some of you are incubating. And we need a blend of production systems, not any one system. So the answer is pretty simple in my opinion. From the perch we have at Land O'Lakes and the experience that, that I've had at Land O'Lakes, we need to change one, more, one word, the or word to the and word. And we need to be a lot more inclusive of different ideas to solve this challenge because it's a whole lot bigger than any one idea. So the call to action that we said to ourselves is, so what are we doing to enrich the debate? And I'm really happy to kind of hand over this next part of the conversation to our emerging leaders in what we call the Global Food Challenge. It's a basic, the program is, is simple and the basic idea is we've gotten 10 sophomores from a variety of universities engaged in this topic about how to feed a hungry planet. And they're thinking over a year about their ideas and they're coming at it from different dif disciplines. Uh, there's assignments throughout the year. Uh, in the summer, it caps off with an internship at Land O'Lakes. Part of that will be coming to our headquarters to work with our team in food, feed, and crop inputs. We'll also send the interns out to the country, to farms, to work with our partners, local cooperatives and growers, and dairy farmers. We'll also send these 10 folks to Africa to make sure the view they have about food solutions is informed by a global perspective. So they'll spend time, uh, two or three weeks, in a variety of countries in Africa, looking at the challenge of food security from a different lens. And then we'll bring them to Washington, D.C. to cap off the program where they'll think about food policy and, candidly, the politics of food policy. So with that, what I'd like to do is introduce three of our 10 emerging leaders to come up and spend about 90 seconds each to just describe what they're thinking about. And we'll start with Oswin from Purdue, and then we'll go from to Mandy of the University of Minnesota, and we'll end with Anna from uh, GW. Thank you, Chris. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Oswin. Uh, I'm from Purdue University, and my plan to positively impact food security by 2050 is through vertical farming. Did you know that 80% of the population will be living in urban centers, such like cities, by 2050? Last time I checked, there's not exactly a lot of arable land here in cities. And that's where vertical farming comes in. With ver these vertical farms, we build right in the cities. Um, with vertical farming, you can one, grow food in a controlled environment. Two, with expected 9.6 billion people, we have to increase food production by 70%. And we can do this um, with vertical farming because we can have year-round farms. And then three, with the use of hydroponic technology, we can actually limit our water usage by 10% instead of using soil-based farming. With this large amount of people that are living in cities, we can't rely or depend on getting our food from other places around the world for our food supply. You know, hunger has been a topic that I've been familiar with since I was in elementary school. And now 15 years later, as a college student, this, this topic of hunger still exists and is stronger than ever. However, now I have the opportunity to do something about it. That's why I'm part of this Global Food Challenge. And that's why vertical farming is so important to me because I think it's a realistic and innovative way to feed the hungry planet. Thank you. My name is Anna, and I'm a sophomore here at the George Washington University studying journalism. Um, and so I was talking to my sister about like a few weeks ago, and she told me that she took a 45-minute shower that day. And she didn't even think anything of it. It wasn't weird for her. And I was a little astounded. I mean, I take like maybe 10 minutes in the shower. I don't know. <laughs> um, but so the average American citizen needs 1,000 gallons of water just for their diet every day where the average global citizen just needs 900 gallons for everything they do. So clearly we're thinking about water in the wrong way in the US. So I'm in the process of researching and developing an app that will track your water usage every day, and at the end of the day, contextualize that for you, saying like, 
you use this many gallons of water today, a farmer in Malawi could use, could grow this amount of crop with that water. So I want to incentivize people to think about the way they use water every day and also incentivize them to use water more efficiently because this issue is going to, f is affecting our generation now in California, in the US, and is going to affect my generation for the years to come way quicker than we expect it to. All right, hi everyone, I'm Mandy Egland. I'm a student at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, I have a very powerful statistic to share with you. One in nine people go hungry every night. I encourage you to look around this room and see how many that would be in here alone. It's kind of astounding. And the idea of my project is to increase education and awareness of the safety of and advancements in the use of genetically modified crops. Because the idea is to do more with less and genetically modified crops can accomplish that because they increase yields and improve sustainability in the field. And we talk about breaking down silos and those barriers and having that cross collaboration and that's gonna be huge to this part of the communication part of my project. And earlier today we also talked and heard from Krista Hardin about how it's an honor and a privilege to be a farmer. But I also think it's an honor and a privilege to be a consumer. So I challenge you all to be mindful consumers and to really be advocates for trying to close that global food gap. And to Frank's point, nothing's good without a good story. So my passion for agriculture stems from my roots. I am originally from Grand Forks, North Dakota, so agriculture is not foreign to me. Uh, and when you grow up and you know where your food comes from and you, you, know, you bought your corn from down the street, it's a little different when you move to the city and you don't have that anymore. And so, you know, challenging that and making sure you understand that is gonna be huge in this program. So I really encourage all of you guys to be advocates for global food security, to join the conversation and to help all of us feed the world. Thank you. Thank you. Well, listen, I'm an optimist. I believe that we can feed the planet. Uh, I believe it is in part by continuing the great productivity story that we know and in large part by embracing the ideas uh, like we just heard and ideas that all of you have on things we don't yet know. Um, the stakes are really high. We will get this right. We can get it, if we get it wrong, there will be economic and political instability. And we'll come back to figuring out how to produce food in a less sustainable way just to address those issues. If we lead and we get it right and lean into it, uh, I believe we can produce the food we need to feed the nine billion that will soon be on the planet in an increasingly sustainable way. Thanks, Frank, for what you've done to convene this forum. Well, thank you very much, Chris. We, you know, there's a lot to chew on there while we digest that and drink the whole thing in here. We, oh, I won't do that. Uh, we have about five minutes or so before I'm going to get you up and start moving you back across the street. So let me let you dive back into your own conversations and, and put a button on them if you have a little call to action, something you've been working on. Maybe we'll share that a little bit later on. Chris, I want to thank you and everybody else. So chow down. We'll start moving you back across the street, as I said, in about four or five minutes. <laughs>